Welcome to Rex Corner. My guest today, uh, John John Park, comes from a very famous legend father, Red Park, who I was uh, always looked up to when I was a kid, and um, he was my inspiration. He and Bill Pearl, and then Arnold always looked up to your dad as well. And uh, I remember all the movies and seeing his thickness and his muscularity, and it's like, man, this is what I want to be like one day. You know, we all have people that we look up to, and he was one of them. Um, did he inspire your training? Yes, well, I originally was a competitive swimmer. Oh. And um, I um, was a South African national champion in the 100 and 200 meter butterfly. And um, at that time, South Africa weren't allowed to compete in the Olympics because of apartheid. Mm -hmm. So through my dad, I was able to get a British passport and um, swim in the British Olympic trials and represented Great Britain in the Montreal Olympics in 1976. I knew that. And um, I always wanted to get into bodybuilding, even when I was swimming. And it was very interesting because at that time, um, my father said to me, fulfill your swimming career. He said, because there's plenty of time for bodybuilding. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I went to Olympics, I was 19. And I just... I excelled in my swimming. When I went to the Olympics, I um, came like 18th in a 100 meter butterfly. And I know I obviously hadn't reached my peak yet. I carried on for another two years, but I really, really wanted to get into the bodybuilding. So I packed in the swimming. I started my own, I had to make a living. By that stage, my dad had sold his gyms. So I um, started my own swimming school from uh, beginners right up to uh, national level competitive national level um, and at the same time I also um, took a job in a, a newly opened gym which was a very popular gym in Johannesburg so between the two of them it kept me pretty busy yeah and um, I started bodybuilding I competed in uh, two competitions in South Africa uh, both of which I won and then I came over to Los Angeles specifically with the goal of pursuing bodybuilding mm -hmm. Uh, what year was that? Uh, I, I came here in 1985. Okay. So I've been here just over 30 years now. And my training partner at the time uh, was Bob Paris. Sure. No Bob. Former Mr. America, Mr. Universe. I've always liked that aesthetic type of thing. Oh, he had a great body. There's no question. So uh, we trained together for about six months. Um, the one thing I never wanted to do... Um, and I was probably a little bit naive, is uh, I didn't want to take steroids. Mm -hmm. I was adamantly opposed to taking steroids. And so after about six months of training, I definitely made progress. But I kind of saw the direction the sport was going. Yeah. In 85 was nothing compared to... Oh, well, not even close. Now. Now. Yeah, not even close. I mean, what the guys took then, you can't even compare it to now. No, you know? no. And so I decided that's not the direction I want to go and I only then realized what my father was saying to me because he, he actually said he thinks at that stage when I was getting into it it's very difficult to do it without steroids and I said well I think if you train hard enough you eat intelligently mm -hmm. you train intelligently and you have um, uh, good genetics you can but you know as I say I was a little naive mm -hmm. probably could have competed in some natural shows but you know, they don't get that much publicity even today. No, they don't. They don't. Sadly. So I started my own training business. And um, I had a personal training gym for about 13 years called World Private Exercise, which was affiliated to World Gym mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And then uh, after a while... Um, is this when Joe Gold had World Gym? This is when Joe yeah. had World Gym. And um, eventually the landlords... Uh, wanted to take over the whole building. They had a wine store. So I had to move out and um, use another facility on a temporary basis. And then I started the uh, Legacy Gym about 10 years ago. At that stage, I went into a partnership with a guy, um, which didn't unfortunately work out. Uh, he had a sports performance facility. Yeah. And uh, cut a long story short basically rode on my coattails and used me to put the whole deal and the whole operation happens together. all the time and so 
we uh, knew we were going to split up. I mean, from day one, it was acrimonious. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, my dad fell ill, and um, I was thinking of a name uh, to use because I knew I was going to change the name. And I thought, well, uh, in bodybuilding, he was known as the legend, mm -hmm. so I called it Legacy Gym. Perfect. And I've been there for uh, almost Actually, ten I years. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Now that matches that. Yeah. Um, in your training, uh, your dad did the basic stuff like five of five, five sets, five reps, and uh, I remember reading about this. And I never actually met him, but back in the day when I was training with Arnold, we would do low reps too. And I, I just recently, this past couple of months, have done the high reps, the twenty, thirty reps, like a lot of people are doing. Yeah. I don't know that it really worked for me. Do you think that works? The high, high reps? reps? Yeah. I'm kind of of the old school principle. Yeah. Um, and I have never really done high reps with the exception of, uh, I think especially when you get old, it's probably better to do high reps on, on your legs. Yeah, points. yeah. Maybe you won't get as much size, but from a conditioning standpoint, I think it's better. Yeah, for legs especially. Yeah. But for uh, biceps, but for example. No. Uh, only, only time I would do high reps, 20 reps would be uh, specifically for for quads yeah. and for pullovers and caps. Okay, yeah, you know. exactly. But anything you know, twenty to fifteens, anything more than that, never worked for me. Doing uh, high reps. Me neither. Uh, like Two weeks ago, I went back and I said, I'm going to start going a little heavier again. Yeah. And my kids always say, It's your age, Dad. Quit going so heavy. You don't need yeah. to do this anymore. You know, you're getting older. But I started going back down to the five, six, seven reps. Right. right. I noticed a difference like within three days. Yeah. My body started to fill out. I got stronger. Yeah. I felt like the old guy I used to be, you know, years ago. And I liked it better. This this 20 rep stuff uh, was just doing nothing for me. I think you're working too much from an endurance standpoint, and there's yeah. other ways to work endurance. Yeah. I think the purpose of, of, of uh, depending on what your goal is, but if we're talking specifically to to keep your muscle size or put on muscle size, um, I think you know you have to h handle load. Yeah. And your load is restricted when you're working. Such totally. Repetition. It, it is. Your dad train heavy. Always train heavy. He did huh? always. Um, well, I mean, needless to say, I mean, he was the second guy in the world to bench press 500 pounds. Yeah. And that's back in the day. That's a lot of weight. But at the time when he did it, uh, and we're talking in the 50s, mm -hmm. um, the first guy to do it was a guy called Doug Hepburn from sure. Canada. Sure, remember him. He was 275 pounds. He wasn't a bodybuilder, though. And he wasn't, he was a powerlifter. Right. My dad did it at a weight of 225 pounds. Mm -hmm. So there's a you know fifty pound difference mm -hmm. three days later. Mm -hmm. um, Arnold told a very cute story um, when my dad uh, passed. In, I was in South Africa obviously at the time, and Arnold um, called me and um, I said to him, "When I get back, I want to have a service for my dad." And he said, "Well, Maria and I would like to host it." So um, we had a, a, a service at the uh, Fairmount Hotel, the Fairmount Miramar Hotel in Santa Monica, which mm -hmm. had over 500 people. Mm -hmm. And um, Arnold said that um, when he first came uh, to visit my dad, um, he would wake up, my, my dad would wake him up at 5 o'clock in the morning and he wasn't used to working out at that time. And my dad said to him at that time, he said, if you get your calves up, because he was a little bit weak in the calves. Right, I remember. In proportion to the rest of his physique. Mm -hmm. He said, you'll be the best bodybuilder in the world. So he told the story and he said, so first of all, he had to get used to training at like 5, 5.30 in the morning. He says, and he thought he was pretty strong because he was doing standing calf raises with 350 pounds, which is a respectable weight. He said, but then Reg would put like a thousand pounds on. <laughs> <laughs> so he always trained heavy. Obviously, as he got older, yeah. he didn't train as heavy and he started changing his approach. I mean, he was really the guy who, you know, started the whole five by five principle. Right, I know. But as, as and, and it's a very successful principle for putting on, uh, for, for strength and size. Right. But um, later on, what he did with the five by five, he kind of modified it, and he said that uh, if you're going to do five by five, because in those days you'd work progressively heavier, mm -hmm. uh, so it then became five by five. But you do a first set as a warm up set right. of like sixty percent maximum. Right. Your second and third set maybe around eighty percent. Your fourth set maximum, and then the fifth set you do a cool down. 
So yeah. Start to have a whole warm up, cool down type of. That makes sense. I mean, we did the same thing. We would start, you know, with the warm up, and we start going heavy. Then the last set, come back down, do a cool down with some reps, and that was the end of it. Yeah. Then on to the next thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, body parts were split up. Like, how did he split the body parts up? Um, typically, he would do. Um, uh, it, it would vary, but he would do. Um, uh, sometimes he do chest and shoulders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he do posing muscle groups, chest mm -hmm. and back. Mm -hmm. uh, typically um, biceps, triceps. Mm -hmm. um, legs would be pretty much on their own. Yep. Sometimes he do. You know, he he often do the old style, which Grimmick started years ago. Yeah. Deep breathing uh, squats superseded with pullovers. Yes, I remember so that. So he'd follow that up with chest. Mm -hmm. You know, he would do. Um, he would do shoulders and arms. It, 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 it varied. Yeah. But, you know, he would, in those days, he, he used to train six days a week. But he said he made his biggest games only training three days a week. Really? Yeah. I've heard that from a lot of people. Yeah. Chet Yorton told me that. Bill Grant, I used to train with Bill. We do four days a week and four days a week. I made my gains. Today yeah. I took the day off and I thought, nah, I've been training hard. I was up a lot last night. I'll just rest. Yeah. And it's hard in your mind to take the time off and you feel like it's doing you no good, but it's doing you some good. Well, I don't have the time I used to have to train, a little lighter than normal, but um, i found in the last few years what works best for me, quite frankly, is uh, three days a week, mm -hmm. and um, I would split it up where I would do uh, chest and back one day, mm -hmm. um, legs on the other day, shoulders and tries and bars on the other day, mm -hmm. and I'd have a day's rest in between, mm -hmm. and I have to tell you, even recently training that way um, I put on muscle very quickly and I started to get in pretty good shape I put on at least 10 pounds of muscle really? in a quick period of time so basically so let's just say you did the, the one day um, was chest and back chest and back okay so let's say it's a Monday right and then you skip Tuesday right you go on Wednesday and you do what on ch ch I'd like to sp w uh, split the um, upper body up, um, give the upper body a break and do the legs on a Wednesday. I see, so you're taking a few days off the upper body. Yes. And so then, then on Friday you go back to the upper body. Yeah, shoulders, tries and bice. Okay, it makes sense. And then Saturday you're off. Saturdays I'm off, but <coughs> I was doing calves each workout. Um, and I also was doing um, three different cycles of training. So I had a heavy cycle which was typically on compound movements, with the exception of uh, legs, five by fives, yeah. um, and on the on the um, more secondary isolation movements, more eight reps. Um, as I say, calves was always in the twenty to fifteen range. Yeah. Quads on the on the heavy day maybe as low as ten reps. So that would be the, uh, the upper body would be, uh, which I've already said, that would be my heavy week. Then I would go into a medium cycle whereby I would do anywhere between the 12 to 15 rep range, mm -hmm. change the movements, and then um, I would, sorry, a 12 to eight, uh, 8 rep range, and then I'd go into the very light cycle, which would be 12 to 15 reps. So the movements would differ and uh, each week would differ, but I found after doing a week of light training I was able to become very glycogen replenished mm -hmm. a lot of recovery yeah and when I went back to the heavy week I was stronger yeah it makes sense so you know that's typically now the way I've started to train and it works for you works for me and frankly uh, Rick I don't even do more than um, three sets per exercise um, I've sort of modified that five by five principle and I, I, I go back, I think there's a lot to be said for um, Arthur Jones, yeah. who invented North sure. Earth. I know he was a little eccentric, um, but he was a, a very bright guy. And uh, his principle, of course, was one set, well, if you include a warm-up set, two. Uh, but it was al always training heavy until right. failure. Right, until failure. For me, I have more of a sort of a, a mesomorphic physique. Um, I find that training like that to failure all the time take, it puts a lot of stress on the joints. Totally, it does. It's, it's, you can only do it for a short time and it seems like 
after about a couple of weeks, you, you can't do it anymore. And, and that's, and interestingly enough, in December, um, I had a, a lunch with Boya Co. We mm-hmm. met down in Huntington Beach. Mm-hmm. And he said that he had trained with Dorian Yates for that for a while, but after a while, he was getting so many muscle strains, he, he couldn't keep up with it. But my theory is the guys that can do that Nautilus principle solely are more meso endo with thicker joints. And their and their joints can handle that right, stress. Right. They're not exact. They're not a pure mesomorph or an ectomesomorph. So, um, what I was doing with my three sets, I was doing a warm up set of around sixty percent. I'd do my second set as maximum, and my third set I'd come down to about 80 percent, um, similar to five by five. But I'd use my third set. Because I was working a little bit lighter, I'd go more to failure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I found by doing that, doing the third set lighter, it would take all the stress off the tendons and the ligaments, joints, yeah. all the connective yeah. tissue. It does. And on my heavy workouts, the heavy cycle, I was only doing one exercise per body part. I wasn't doing any more. So for chest, for example, maybe incline dumbbell press, that was it. Uh, then I'd do some pullovers and then a, a compound back movement like a bent over row. The, in your mind, did you feel like you weren't doing enough? No, because I was making very good gains and my strength was increasing. Okay. And I've done that twice, I would say, in the last five to ten years. And I found that I've made the most progress with that. And I found, especially as one gets a little older, less is probably more. Yeah. Because when you think about it, um, every set you do, if you train hard, and you certainly train hard through your life, yeah, I mean, I see the pictures of, you know, back yeah. in the day. Um, your glycogen depletes at least 10% per set. So to work progressively heavier each set when your glycogen level is going down, I think it's, uh, it's contrary to what you, you want to achieve. Yeah, yeah. So I find that by mixing it up with the different rep ranges, as I now say, 15s would be my maximum in terms of high reps. Okay, let's talk about diet. Your dad followed what type of a diet? The old school high protein, low carb. Uh, my dad ate pretty much everything. Did he? he? He really did. I mean, he always used to feel if you train hard enough, you can eat anything. Uh, There's a lot of people that feel that way, but I don't know about yeah. you. But for me, I don't know if that works. Um, I think as you get older, I don't think it does work. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he used to eat. My mother was a fantastic cook. Uh, he used to eat good quality wholesome foods he certainly used to eat a lot of protein yeah a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables you know back in the day you'd have dairy because he grew up in england Mm -hmm. and it was different uh, milk in those days to what we Mm -hmm. we have now Mm -hmm. it was straight out of the cow in those days and there was no such thing as corn fed you know, kids yeah. back in England. Well, a lot know. of the guys back in the day drank milk. They drank uh, cream, or really extra rich milk. I know Blair had yeah. them on that program where you, the Blair. cream and the, and the protein was supposed yeah. to work, and the, the cream had the fats that used as energy. Yes. Um, but like your dad, I mean, we all ate a lot of food. It was a lot of meat and milk and cheese. Yes, exactly. I can't do that now. No, and he, he didn't eat like that so much towards his left. <laughs> How do you eat? Do you, how's your diet? Well, you know, I, um, I uh, get at least one meal a day from a mutual good friend of ours, Jesse yes, Keller do. from NutriFit, right. which really helps. But I eat, I have a sweet tooth. My dad had a tremendous sweet tooth. I think we all do. But, um, so I'll, I, 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 um, I allow myself to uh, uh, enjoy certain things. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I, I try and eat a good variety from all your basic food groups. I really stay away from white starches. Yeah. Um, I, um, I I prefer to eat more organically based. I don't eat as much red meat as I used to. I mean, growing up in South Africa, it was pretty much a staple diet. Yeah. But then even if I do eat red meat, it will be more lean cuts and also preferably grass fed. Um, and um, I, I, I don't ever touch sodas. No, I don't eat Any either. carbonated drinks. No. I don't eat refined sugars. You know, if I have chocolate, which I like, I'll have organic chocolate, preferably 70%. 
in a company. Well, they say that dark chocolate is good for you. It actually is. Yeah, good. I've heard yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, you get to the point where, I mean, when you're training back in those days, we had our junk day on Sundays and we would eat everything. Yeah. Cheesecake and spaghetti and pizza and yeah. ice cream and all that kind of, I can't really go crazy on the ice cream. Yeah. But you get to the point where it's not satisfying anymore. No, it's and you feel lethargic and sluggish. And, and now, frankly, I always tell people, if you're going to have a junk day, it's actually better to do it on a Saturday than a Sunday. Because the energy we use on a Monday, which is the start of the week, yeah, uh, and maybe your first workout of the week, is based on what you had the day before. Yeah. So I always tell people, use Sunday as a clean-out day. Drink mm-hmm. a lot of water, you know, flush the toxins out, and maybe do some uh, some uh, active recuperation. Go for a nice walk or a hike. Maybe not. Yeah. Just something different. Level of something. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. What's the pictures you brought? So. Um, this is a picture of um, of my dad and Arnold. I've seen that so, shot. In so right about, let's see if we can do that right about here. Okay, explain that. So, um, you know, 1965 was my dad's last Mr. Universe contest. Mm-hmm. And he was planning on retiring. And um, Arnold uh, was... By that stage, he was living in California, sponsored by Weida, and uh, he was 23. My dad was 42, and he issued my dad a challenge to compete against him in the universe. Yeah. So my dad came out of retirement, and he trained for three months for the competition. And um, famous this was all story. a friendly challenge. Though. It was a friendly challenge, but somewhat competitive. Yeah. And Arnold beat my dad by half a point. Um, I'm biased, but if you if you look at this picture, I think from an aesthetic symmetrical point of view, I think Reg had a superior physique in terms of a smaller waist, squarer pecs. Yes, he did. More cap deltoids. Yes, he did. And he had the foresight many many years ago, even though he was renowned for bench pressing, he stopped doing flat bench press because he felt that the lower pec, which is easy to develop, right was getting too heavy and he didn't want to throw the symmetry off. Great. He also didn't want to have heavier lower pecs when he got older. And if you look at the difference in the pec... Like yeah, these are much higher. Higher, smaller waist, mm-hmm. you know. The, uh, the, you're right about the lower pec because yeah. I, I, even myself, I know when you get older, the lower pec starts to hang Yes, on Correct. guys. And they, they're always doing decline strength to the bigger lower pec Correct. when you should really work on your upper chest. Correct. And, uh, and it's an overrated exercise, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. It is. You know? It is. Uh, I mean, I know it's a benchmark in a lot of sports. Uh, and, of course, it's a strength builder. But when you think about it, like guys on a football field, mm-hmm. they're not lying down. You know, you're standing up and pushing it's true. people. It's true. Around. So um, he actually he taught me many, many years ago, it's not really the angle of the bench that determines where you're going to hit it, although flat generally speaking because where you bring the bar but it's the, it's the positioning of the elbow so he would say you could even work your upper pecs lying on a decline just by positioning your elbow back a little bit more and hitting your upper pectorals makes sense so uh, you know he competed two more times after that but you know this is the era where things changed yeah and he, w- awesome there. he was known his whole career to be clean you know and it started to change. He came back and he competed against um, um, a Pearl and a Lever one year, but he came in way, way too light. He was too lean. He came in like between 210 and 215. That's pretty light. Which didn't suit his structure. Yeah. He was a big man. And then I think he came back one more year and he competed against Co. But, you know, he was already like near then in his mid 40s. Um, my mom's brother, uh, John Isaacs. Mm-hmm. He uh, was one of the original Muscle Beach guys. Yes, he was. I knew him. And uh, he always, he won a Mr. Universe. A, yeah. And he was, uh, always used to win. Uh, this shot was taken in 1958, so you can see it's pretty far advanced for yeah. those days with his musculature. Yeah. But he always used to win the best back, best arms, most muscular. So it's kind of on both sides of the family. Yeah, everybody knew John. Yeah. What a nice guy. Very nice. I just recently saw him, actually. I haven't seen him for five years. He lives up in Washington State. Now. And he's still training? Uh, he's, he's, he's slowed down a little bit. He's 86 now. Oh, boy. He still says he does bicep curls with 12 or 15 pounds. Um, unfortunately, I saw him because uh, his daughter, my first cousin, who lives in Agoura, she's 
uh, terminally ill now. Oh, I'm sorry. So he came to see her. You know, it's hard um, as you get older, and I know a lot of you guys that watch us, you're in your 20s and 30s, and we have a big audience in their 50s and 60s too that really didn't remember all this stuff. But you know, and I had said this before, your life goes so fast. Yeah. And when you're back in these days with these guys, and I was back at the beach in those days, I used to think to myself, this is the perfect moment. It's never going to end. It's going to be this way for the rest of my life. I'll live here in Santa Monica. I'll train at Gold's. I'll hang out with the guys. We'll go to the beach. And this is what I'm doing the rest of my life. Yeah. And now it's gone. Yeah. Done. Yeah. It's not even closely related to be the same thing anymore. Well, you know, Rick, I think unfortunately today, besides the chemistry distorting the sport completely, yeah. and I'm not sure about you, I love to train. I love the old school. I really don't have any interest in the sport as it is. I don't either. I wouldn't even go to a show. And the interesting thing you say that is I've spoken to Zane and when I had lunch with Co. And these are all great. Bill Grant. Yeah, but Boyer and both uh, okay. Bill have been on the show. And, and, and Boyer said to me, if the Mr. Olympia was across the road from where he lived, mm -hmm. he wouldn't go and watch it. Mm -hmm. None of the guys from that era can relate. No. I mean, I've seen uh, Bill Pearl at shows. He doesn't even stay in no, to I watch know. the show. I know. And I remember, <laughs> I'm going back now even longer, um, a number of years ago, uh, when my dad was still alive, they had a, a reunion, uh, a 50th year anniversary for the NABA Mr. Universe. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad was there, John Isaacs was there, Bill Pearl was there. Um, Steve Reeves was still alive, he was there, and then Earl Maynard, who was a Mr. Universe, I knew Earl very well, yeah. there. So, uh, you're talking about five guys who were, who were pretty synonymous in the field in yeah. those days. Ten minutes into the show, my dad turned around to my mom and said, I, cannot, I can't watch this. I can't relate to a guy five foot two, weighing 240 pounds. Mm -hmm. He said, let's go. At intermission, Steve Reeves turned around to my Uncle John and he said, Where's Reg? He said, I'm, uh, um, he's left. Bill Pearl said, where's Reg? He's left. None of the guys I mentioned sat through the second half of the show. Mm -hmm. They couldn't relate to it. No, no. And now it's become even more distorted than it ever was. It's, it's funny because I do the same thing with wrestling. I wrestled back in the 60s and 70s yeah. with the old, old school guys that trained at Golds as well. Yeah. And it was a different game back then. And now I, I don't even watch it on TV. And I have guys that train out here that they watch it and it's, they don't really like what it's become. And bodybuilding's done the same thing. It's just not what it used to be. Yeah. But everything takes its course. I mean, music has and everything, entertainment, everything has changed over the years. And it's not that you get stuck in a rut and you want to think old and be what it is, but it was so much better back then. Well, I also think that there was a much better camaraderie. Yeah, uh, totally. You know? Yeah. And I can tell you that after the first time my dad won the Mr. Universe, he was a little bit disappointed. He thought it was an anticlimax when you're standing on the DS receiving his trophy because he said what he enjoyed more than that was the training. Mm -hmm. And Boyer actually shared the same thing, story with me, a similar story. He said he always enjoyed the training more than the competing. The competing yeah. was just a part of it. it it's, a, it's a part of it. It's like the icing on the cake. But still, I mean, it's, the thing is, is and, and how old are you now? I'm 59. Are you really? Yeah. yeah. I never would have guessed that. <laughs> ever, you. ever, Thank ever. The, the the thing is, is that uh, I'll be 72 in July. Okay. Well, you look I, fantastic. I go to the gym every day. Yeah. I have injuries from wrestling. I have a knee and knee replacement. My shoulders hurt. Uh, I lost a finger. My hands are numb from carpal tunnel. And I don't even think about it. I get up and I go to the gym. It's what I do. It's habitual. It's part it of is, and, and it's part of my life. And someone said to me, do you ever get bored going every day? I never get bored. I wake up in the morning, eat, and I go to the gym. all fired up to have a good training program. Yeah. And I'll hit it hard, and I'll feel good when I leave. And I went to lunch today. What I have? A hamburger patty, eggs, and cottage cheese. Yeah. My old school diet. Because it works for me. Yeah. And I feel good about it. And if you feel good mentally, you'll feel good physically. Yeah, and your body fat is low. Well, it's not as low as it used to be. Okay, but still. I have a girlfriend know. that likes to have ice cream at night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that every night, but at my age, I guess I'm allowed to have but it. But you know what? I think it's very important that you enjoy your life. Too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not going to be what it was years ago. I got some abs there, but they're not where they... All right, if I died for the next four weeks, I could be hard. But, it's, but why? Yeah. What for? Yeah. For what reason? Yeah. You know, maybe it'd be a little slimmer. I, I, I might just do it just to see if I can do it. But your body changes as you get older, and you try to make make it work like it did yeah. and uh, pretty much is okay yeah. so yeah. we do what we do well a, a study came out of McGill University just just recently saying that you know for people when they get older to keep working out uh, it actually affects the neurons in the body yes and uh, we know that yeah I mean I have a client 
who I'm very fond of, uh, yeah, by the name of Dusty Snyder. Mm -hmm. Now he's been training with me for about 20, 25 years. He's now going on uh, 83. Mm -hmm. And nobody, and I mean nobody, can believe this guy's age. Really? He still works a full day. He's in the financial field, so you know he's got to be using his brain. He's a, he dresses immaculately, very dapper. He's a gentleman. And I can on, he used to run marathons, and now he runs 10Ks. And I've been seeing him on a regular basis. And we all know it's a fact of life that as you get older, you're going to get weaker. I can honestly say that this guy has actually gotten stronger since he first started training mm. with me. And it's consistency. It yes, there's genetics there too. Genetics plays a big role. We know that because his father lived to be 100. Yeah. But, you know, it just shows you he's been consistently coming every week for the last 25 odd years and the guy's in incredible shape. Yeah, you know what it is also too, you get used to using a heavy weight on the bench. My bench press was, best was 445, okay. Yeah. I can't do it now, I don't know if yeah. I can even do 200. Yeah. But I don't do benches anymore, yeah. I do a machine. Exactly. So when you get away from doing that kind of thing, it's like you gotta start all over again. Yeah. Curls, curls are always 60, 55, 65s. So I dropped down to the reps of 20s, yeah. 25s maybe. And then it became hard, it's like, why am I doing a 20 pound dumbbell when I did so much heavier before? Exactly. And I got used to that, so the last two weeks I've up to 40. 35s, yeah, they're hard because I haven't done them in a long time. Right, right. But now they're starting to get easier again, right, right. and I'm getting results from it. So when it, it, it's powerlifting to me was the basis of bodybuilding when okay. I started bench press, deadlift, and squat. Right. It gave you a foundation. You got heavy, and you were a young guy, and nothing hurt. And it did give you power to go heavy on stuff, and then really work your muscles. But as you get older, it's it uh, it does play havoc on the joints. Hundred percent. Yeah, it does play havoc, and you can't do what you used to do, but you do the best that you can do. And and machines. As much as I like free weights, and I do, there's machines today that almost duplicate what you can do with a free weight. Yeah, yeah. It's in your head. Well, I think it's in your head. I think there's another factor that's very important too, which I find when I'm training now, I spend much more time doing than I used to. I can spend between 20 to 30 minutes just warming up upper body alone. On legs, I can spend 45 minutes. Because, you know, we're more susceptible, we're mm -hmm. more prone. And if you've trained hard enough and been involved in sports, you're going to have some history of injury. Yeah. So I do a lot of dynamic movement before I even pick up a weight. Yeah. You know, warming up all my joints. It's time consuming. Up. It's time consuming. Uh, it can be a little bit boring. Yeah. And most people don't have the patience to do it. Yeah. But I think for longevity, and for uh, purposes of preventing injury, I think it's very, very important. I think you're right. And a lot of the clients that I deal with today, they're a little bit surprised, you know, those who are a little older when they first start, because my philosophy with them is many of them have imbalances between left or right side or, you know, scoliosis, whatever it is. Uh, so I spend maybe the first half a dozen workouts when I formulate a program for them, opening them up, getting them to move, working on the imbalances. Because if I'm just going to put them straight in the gym, which anybody can do and make them start lifting yeah, weights, yeah. all you're going to do is exacerbate your conditions. So I find a lot of people like the difference between left and right side. Therefore, if that's the case, why use a barbell to do curls? You're better off using dumbbells. There you go. Uh, yeah. The new cable machines, instead of having a bar, they have two separate handles. Mm -hmm. This way, if, if, if I said to somebody, I want you to go and do pull downs until you reach failure, you know ultimately they're going to use their strong side more than their weak. So with yes. two independent handles, you're not allowing your strong side to help your weak side. It's really funny because I'm relating to something I did last year. My knee is shot, my right knee is shot. I definitely need a knee replacement. I can do leg press, I can do extensions and all that. But this leg carries this leg. So I was down in Venice Goals and they have a leg extension machine that's this one, this one, this one, this one. Right. Normally I do both. Right. So I did my left leg and I went to do my right leg and the thing didn't budge. I couldn't move my right leg because of the knee shot. Right. My, showed me that my left leg's taking over for everything I do. Even though I can flex it and work it somewhat, it's not getting a full full feeling out of our full range. Right, right. So that one needs to be repaired so that it can have the strength of the left one. Right. And uh, it would take probably several months of working it by itself to get it up there. Even if it would, 
I still think the knee has to be replaced. But I'm, I'm, I, it's what you said, sides have to balance out. Yeah, and, 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 and even with a lot of people, what I do, whether it be a stretch or an exercise, I might do a two-for-one ratio, Yeah. whereby they're doing two 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 sets more on the weak side right now on the strong side right uh, as we know especially after in fact the Japanese have a term saying 50 shoulders you've been active most people have been active or walking around with maybe they're not uh, uh, significant but they're walking around with perhaps micro tears in the shoulder oh sure and most people have had some form of rotator cuff sure. problem sure uh, so I think therefore when you get to a certain age I mean, I don't give any client, Rick, I never ever give a client, unless he's a young guy training for bodybuilding to put on some, put on some muscular thing, I never give them lateral raises or flies. I don't see the purpose. Mm-hmm. I'd rather do a compound movement which incorporates uh, the whole joint, the multi-joint movement. Like what? Uh, for example, for shoulders, I'd rather give somebody a shoulder press. Okay. And I'd give them dumbbells as opposed to a bar or okay. a machine. Yeah. Because then they can use each side independently. That's true. Um, I also like to do a shoulder press. A lot of people have a problem with their shoulder because their lats are too tight. Mm-hmm. And if your lats are too tight, you don't have any mobility. Mm-hmm. So I open up the lat before we even start doing any shoulder work. And when I do the shoulder presses, I do it more like a letter C, where you're going over the head instead of straight up. So you're getting that lat stretch. Yeah, it makes sense. Opening up the yeah. lat. But if you're talking like shoulder injuries, you want to avoid wide work later on. So with the new machines they have, these functional trainer machines with the single handles, you can have them parallel working in this range, so you don't have to go out wide and put all that extra stress on it. It makes a lot of sense. I remember doing wide bench presses way out, way out to get my chest worked out. It was okay, but it did play on my shoulders later on. You would never do it now. No, I didn't do it now. (laughs) And you wouldn't recommend it. No, I wouldn't recommend it either. Um, So your gym is in... uh, what? It's, it's in uh, uh, West LA on Cotner Avenue. Okay, now is this a private gym for? It's, it's, it, we have a membership base, but I would say that it's uh, at least ninety percent personal training. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it's not a lot of equipment, because just like what we're talking about, the best results are you go, the, the game. I I feel that the, the the best trainers today, if you look at it. It's got a 360. All these machines are great, especially mm-hmm. these functional training machines, mm-hmm. but a lot of them you're fixed into one movement. Yes, you are. And um, the machines, you have to fit into the machine. It's not built for you. Right. So um, besides pulleys and cables, I don't really have a lot of selectorized equipment. Yes, I have a, a leg press that does a seated and lying, and I have a combination seated, uh, uh, seated leg curl leg extension. But other than that, I don't really have a lot of machines. It's mostly free weights. Mm -hmm. Because I think with machines, it's isolation. But you don't learn mind-muscle connection. And I don't think you work the muscle in its entirety. Yeah, I think you're right. Makes sense to me. Um, Where can people reach you on the internet if they want to talk to you or send you an email? Or is there a website? Uh, We have a website. It's uh, thelegacy-gym.net. Okay. And uh, email me, it's jpark at thelegacygym.com. Okay, I'll put that up so people can see it. Yeah. I appreciate you taking time to go over. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you. I've been trying to get to you for over a year. Yeah, we've been trying for over a year. You're on the other side of the hill, I'm on this side of the hill, and he said, Mornings, it's really hard for me, but this worked out fine. I'm I'm pleased it did. Thank you so much, John John. I had free time, it was a pleasure. Yes, yes, finally. We can meet and have fun. Yeah. I want to thank you guys for watching. This has been a real pleasure with John John Park. His dad is a legend. He's a hero in my eyes. He was a hero for many, and we all looked up to him. He was an awesome guy with an awesome body and an awesome mind. And um, I, I respect I respect everything he's set the path for. And respect you as, as uh, John John Park. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time.
It's RickDrayson.com. He is the equalizer, baby. See you next time.